You'll have your 11th quiz, the last quiz. Um, and your experiment 811 report is due this week. So make sure you have that ready to go. Uh, next week, because we don't have lab on Thursday, because people will all be celebrating Thanksgiving, or at least not here, um, we, won't have, we don't have lab, okay? So there's no lab Tuesday, because we don't have lab Thursday. We don't have a pre-lab lecture next week either, so next Monday, no pre-lab lecture. Um, open lab, though, for next week is extended a little bit because we don't have lab on Tuesday. So the Monday, Monday next week, same schedule, 9.30 to 3.30. Tuesday, the labs will be open for open lab from 9 to 4. And Wednesday, um, the labs will be open from 9.30 to 12. Okay. If this, this schedule isn't great for you, come see me. And we'll, we'll talk about it. But um, usually by noon on Wednesday, most people have, have left campus or at least far enough away they don't want to be in organic. Um, and your experiment 12 report is due next week. So even though we don't have lab, you do have a report due. So make sure, make sure you check in with your lab prof to see how that's going to be handed in. In two weeks, so the week I get to see you all again, in lab we'll be doing the data comparison for experiment 14. You'll be checking out of your lab for um, doing some cleaning projects in the lab and doing evaluation. So I want to let you know the last day of lab, do plan on probably a couple hours worth of work in the lab. Don't plan on just going and checking out. You're going to have to do the data comparison, um, the evaluations, check out, and also have a cleanup job. So it's going to take a little bit of time in lab. Um, experiment 14 report is due at the end of um, Next, that week. So in two weeks, experiment 14's report is due. See your lab prop for that due date. Due date. And then in the back of the um, lecture hall, I have left you your practice exam for the final exam. So the final exam is December 12th from 3 to 5 in here. So that Thursday of exam week. Exam week. Okay. Um, from three to five in here, everybody will be gathering all at once to take the lab exam. So make sure that you are here and able to be here. Okay. <coughs> if you um, have special testing accommodations through academic support or otherwise, make sure you see me. I am the person that signs the paperwork for that one. So make sure that you see me for that and see me like the next time I see you, two weeks from Monday, so on the 2nd of December, uh, have that paperwork so we can take care of it on that day. Okay. All right, after all those lengthy announcements, um, today we're going to talk about a reaction you guys haven't seen yet in lectures. That always makes things a little bit more exciting. Which, last week I talked about Diels Alder, I didn't know you hadn't seen it in lecture, I just pretended like you had, but at least this week I know you haven't seen this one yet. So you're, um, you're just starting to talk about aromatic rings in lecture, Towards the end of the week, you will be moving on to reactions with aromatic rings, okay? We are going to use one of those reactions this week in lab. So we're going to use the friedel crafts um, alkylation reaction. Conveniently named after Friedel and Crafts. Two different people. And so... We, up until now, we've told you basically aromatic rings themselves pretty much aren't very reactive. You've looked at reactions of other types of functional groups, including um, alkenes, um, but we haven't done anything with an aromatic ring. Well, now we're going to do that. But the thing is, is the aromatic <coughs> ring likes being aromatic. It really wants to stay that way. So you have to urge it along even more so than you would an alkene. It's not going to be as reactive as an alkene. Um, but it wanting to be an aromatic ring will help you re-aromatize the ring when you're done with the reaction, okay? So we are going to um, be looking at the alkylation of an aromatic ring with an electrophile. You need a really good electrophile to make this work. So the electrophiles that you use to react with alkenes 
usually are not themselves going to react with an aromatic ring. So we're going to need to make something even more electrophilic to make it um, want to react. And so, um, and hence the name of this is electrophilic aromatic substitution, or an example of that. And again, at the end of the week, you'll be looking at lots of these types of reactions. So this general reaction, we're going to take an aromatic ring. We're going to use an alkyl halide. So we've seen these before. We saw our alkyl halides in our um, Grignard reaction. And we also need a Lewis acid catalyst. And the reason for that is that is going to help us prepare a carbocation with this alkyl halide to react with the aromatic ring. So just it having electrophilic character is not good enough. You take an alkyl halide with an aromatic ring, it's really not going to do a whole lot on the aromatic ring. Um, but we need to actually make it into a carbocation. And so then, once we do, we will actually alkylate one of the carbons of the aromatic ring. So an example of this, I'm going to go through the mechanism with this example, and then I'll show you the reaction that we're going to use, which follows um, the same type of mechanism. So if we take, um, we're going to take chloro, uh, two chloro propane, that will be our alkyl halide. And the first thing that has to happen is the reaction with the Lewis acid with the alkyl halide before any reaction is going to take place on the aromatic ring. And what we get is kind of this in-between where we get the starting of dissociation of our chloride, so it's kind of partially associated to our carbon but it's also partially associated to the aluminum of the aluminum chloride, okay? So you've got this kind of in-between here. Um, but then you get um, this type of electron flow where we're going to end up with a positive charge here on our carbon. So this is going to be remnants of our, bromo or our uh, chloropropane. So we generate this carbocation and then we make AlCl4 minus, okay? So we're completely disassociating our chloride from our carbon. And that's how we generate our carbocation. But we need the Lewis acid to be able to do that. <coughs> so then we've got our aromatic ring. In this case, I'm going to start with just looking at benzene. And then in a little bit, we'll talk about reactions beyond just benzene. So if we have benzene, we want it to react with our newly formed carbocation and our, our counter ion here is our aluminum chloride or minus. Um, so now we've got this really good electrophile giving a reason to have this reaction proceed. Okay, So we'll have electron flow that way and what we get is we've unaromatized the ring, lost, lost its aromaticity, so we've got a positive charge now on this ring. We can look at this as either AlCl4 minus, or even just think about it as our Cl minus. <coughs> And so if it, our negative charge comes in and takes our proton, we can re-aromatize our ring, reform our ring. And so that making that aromatic ring again is the driving force to finish off this reaction. We have our isopropyl group off of our aromatic ring and then 
We've made HCL in the process, and we regenerated our catalyst. Okay. Now, if you think of this in terms of energetics involved, if we look at um, the energy involved of an alkene to its intermediate versus an aromatic ring to this arom intermediate, that okay, we have our aromatic ring that's perfectly happy and stable way down here. Its intermediate is going to be more up here versus an alkene is going to have less of a leap to go to our, its highest energy point, okay? But the coming back down to being aromatic again is lower than this was, and so, and you have reformed something that's much lower energy, and so you have a driving force to go back down that hill, okay? So it takes a lot of energy to get up there, and you need just the right conditions to get up there, but coming back down the hill is a lot easier to do, and you have a reason to do that, all right? The other thing we have to think about here is a lot of times with aromatic rings, I'm gonna draw these on the bottom here, we've got this resonance form, Are there more resonance forms than that? Can you move your electrons around that ring? Yeah, yeah and so um, there's actually three different resonance forms that are possible. And so you can have here and here, you're still adding to that same carbon. Now our positive charge would be over here. Lopsided, or you could end up moving your electrons around such that you end up with the positive charge over here. So again, adding to that same carbon. So for this part right here, we have three possible resonance forms that can form for that carbon, um, for that cation, okay, for that cation intermediate. So that's going to come into play too here in a little bit, looking even at the reaction that we're going to do. So we're already going to have a group on our aromatic ring um, instead of just using benzene. Um, this is good for the example, but this actual reaction is pretty slow. It really doesn't go very quickly at all. Okay? It is a reaction that can take place, but it really doesn't, benzene itself is so happy, it really doesn't have a huge driving force to take place. That energy barrier you have to climb is really, really large. Um, but we're going to add a new component here. And put a different substituent on. So everybody is going to start their reaction this week with toluene. You're already going to have a methyl group on your aromatic group. And that will help make our reactions progress a little bit better. We'll talk about why that is here in a minute. We are going to be using two different alkyl halides, okay? We're going to use one bromopropane. And we're going to use two bromopropane. <coughs> In a little bit here, we'll talk about how we're going to divvy up 
the tasks here. So you'll be assigned, everybody will start with toluene, and based on the conditions you're going to use, you're going to either use one bromopropane or you're going to use two bromopropane. So if we look at just the possible reactions that can occur starting with toluene and what relative to the methyl group of toluene, we can get different substitution on, on our aromatic ring. Okay? And so we could get toluene with the propane that adds propyl group adds like that. So what is what substitution is that on the aromatic ring? Ortho, when you have one, two substitution, it's ortho. We can add like this. Opposite our um, methyl group, so what's this guy? Para, one, four substitutions. And so what's our last guy gonna be? Met at the one, whoops, one three substitution. And that was just with one bromopropane. So now we've got two bromopropane. We can have all of those possibilities as well due to the two bromopropane. Okay. And so if you're using two bromopropane, you can get ortho substitution. substitution <coughs> and you could get meta substitution okay so so far does that make sense as possibilities and it depends, again, you're only going to be assigned one alkyl halide, okay? And we're going to, in the end, be pooling class data to look at all these possibilities, okay? Now, why is this methyl group important? It's what it does to that aromatic ring. So I'm gonna show you a table here that you're going to look at in much more detail as you go through these different reactions, um, substitution reactions with aromatic rings. Um, so you will, fully get involved in this entire table, um, which is in McMurray, okay? The part we wanna talk about right now is this part here. So a methyl group is known as an orthopara activator on an aromatic ring. So when you have a methyl um, substituent, it's going to be an orthopara directing activator. And so what that means is you're going to direct um, the reaction towards substitution in either the ortho or para position, and it's activating the aromatic ring, meaning it's making it um, more reactive than benzene itself. Okay. Um, with that methyl group, if you can remember, probably, I don't know, a little bit ago here in lecture, they probably have been talking about inductive effects as you've been going around going along looking at different reactions. Does that sound like a familiar term? Okay, so inductive effects as well as resonance are really important to um, substitution reactions with aromatic rings, okay? <coughs> and with the inductive effects, you can either be electron donating or you can be electron withdrawing. A methyl group is um, electron donating, so it gives a little bit of electron density to the aromatic ring. And um, so that helps the reaction take progress faster um, because of that, because of that stability. So what we're gonna look at that helps explain that is if we look at the resonance structures, and we're going to look at um, our secondary carbocation. So the car carbocation that's generated from using two bromopropane, but the same resonance structures can be drawn, drawn for one bromopropane. It's just you have a propyl group here instead of an isopropyl group. So if we look at the three resonance structures that can form when you add at ortho 
if you add it meta, if you add it the para position, para to the methyl group, just like I drew for adding to benzene, that positive charge whoops, <coughs> that is on the aromatic ring moves around as you change resonance forms, okay? As you're moving the electrons around that ring with different resonance forms, that positive charge is moving around, okay? Um, and now I just told you that the methyl group itself is a little bit electron donating. And so what would that do as far as a carbocation? Would it help stabilize it? If it's giving a little bit of electron density to that carbocation, it's going to help it make it more stable than it would be without. And so with this reaction, our kinetic products, and part of this experiment is going to be talking about kinetic versus thermodynamic. So the kinetic products, the products that are going to form immediately that have an uh, energetic driving force to do so, are our ortho and para products. And so that comes from these resonance structures. So if you look in the ortho resonance structures, you've got a resonance structure where you have the carbocation on the same carbon as that methyl group. So you've got a tertiary carbocation with an electron donating group that's attached to that carbon. So that's going to help stabilize um, that substitution, okay? Same with para. You've got a resonance structure that is going to have a positive charge on the carbon where you've got this electron donating group. You've got a tertiary carbon um, <coughs> or tertiary carbocation. And so that's going to help stabilize um, that carbocation and make it more favorable. So this resonance form and this resonance form make the substitutions more favorable because of the intermediate and how it's stabilized. Okay? With the meta substitution, you do not end up with a charge on the carbon with the methyl group. And so it's less favorable than the ortho and para. Does everybody see that? Yes. Okay. And so what I recommend is with all this, um, because resonance is such a huge part of all of these types of reactions, of this reaction and all the other reactions you're going to look into, practice drawing these resonance structures. So you know for the ortho, meta, and para substitution, there are three resonance structures each. Practice drawing those so you get better at understanding what's going on um, with that aromatic ring because inductive effects and resonance effects are really important in this whole um, in the reactions with the aromatic rings, okay? Um, so from the get-go, we can say, kinetically, ortho and para are going to be more, um, more favored. Now, thermodynamically, that's something that you need experimental evidence for. You can't necessarily right off the bat say what's going to be thermodynamically favored, okay? And so between ortho and para, is there one that you would say would be more favored versus the other? Probably para, why? The Just the sterics. Ortho, you've got that, the methyl group and whatever's off on the second carbon much closer together, okay? So you can say that probably para is going to be more favored thermodynamically than ortho. But what is truly favored um, in thermodynamic conditions, um, we can't say without doing the experiment. So that's going to be part of the experiment that you do, is looking at this kinetic versus thermodynamic, okay? Another thing is when, in McMurray, when they're telling you that there's a preference of one thing over the other, that's all kinetics. McMurray doesn't really use the kinetic versus thermodynamic preference or <coughs> argument, but when um, in there it talks about products that are going to form um, in certain situations over others, it's going to involve kinetics, not really the thermodynamic argument, okay? So just keep this in mind and these possible compounds um, in mind as possible products when you're analyzing your data and then when you're getting information about um, what the thermodynamic conditions, what could have formed. Um, let's see, anything else there? I think that's good. So now, another thing we have to talk about 
is our carbon cation itself. So we've got these six possible products that can form, depending on the alkyl halide that is used. The other thing is when you use one bromopropane, it can get a variety, it can form a variety of products as well. Okay? And so from the get-go, we've already talked about it can form. Ortho and para and meta propyl products. These are when we're talking about one bromopropane and the carbocation that's formed, we form a primary carbocation to make this, right? So, when this is initially reacted with the Lewis acid, we get this primary carbocation. We form these products, okay? These products are the re result of what we call, this is our kinetic carbocation, okay? Or our kinetic products. Well, this carbocation can actually rearrange. <coughs> and so previously, in previous pictures, we talked about hydride shifts. What's more um, stable, a primary carbocation or a secondary carbocation? Secondary. Secondary. So it can rearrange given um, time to equilibrate and energy to do so. It can rearrange to a secondary carbocation. Okay? And so one bromopropane can form these products. If the carbocation rearranges, it can also form these products. with six products from one bromopropane as well, okay? So just the one bromopropane can give you the propyl products. If it's carbocation rearranges, you can also get the isopropyl products, okay? Now, with two bromopropane, what do you expect? Will you get propyl products out of it? Not, not to a huge degree. Maybe a little bit with a lot of heat. But there's really not a driving force to go from here to here. There is a driving force to have your carbocation go from here to here to get to that. Okay? But there's not a reason to go from a secondary carbocation back to a primary carbocation to regenerate these. Okay? So bromopropane, one bromopropane, six possible products, two bromopropane, three possible products. Okay? For the most part. Okay, how is that so far? Okay. All right. So we've got two different things we're looking at. Where we are substituting on the ring and what what is reacting, what carbocation is reacting when you're looking at one bromopropane. So to do this, we would need if you were to get yourself all the data that you need to analyze this, you would need to look at the reaction under four different sets of conditions. But we're not going to have you run the reaction at four times under four, four different sets of conditions. We're going to break up the work, okay? And so we're going to have four different sets of conditions, but your, your lab prof is going to assign you one of those conditions. And then when we talked about having data comparison for experiment 14, then you're going to discuss with the other three members of your group the data that you come, came up with out of your reaction, okay? 
And so, um, remember, everything is being added to toluene. starting with toluene. And toluene is one of your reactants. Toluene is also the solvent for the reaction as well. So our condition A, and this is defined in your lab manual as well. So I'm, my A corresponds to what your lab manual tells you. You're going to do the reaction at zero degrees. Okay, so it's going to be done in an ice bath after you have added um, the aluminum chloride. So make sure you follow the instructions in your lab manual. If you're using conditions A, um, you're going to add the aluminum chloride at room temperature and then the reaction itself will take place um, in an ice bath. And so condition A, zero degrees, ice bath, um, one bromopropane will be reacting. And so you can get propyl, to your toluene, okay? Or you can get the isopropyl product. Again, ortho, ortho para, or meta products. Okay, condition B, we're going to use reflux and our one bromopropane. Here, we'll just draw it like this. We'll either get our propyl group Parameta, or we'll get our isopropyl group. Condition C, we're going to do this at zero degrees again, but this time we're going to use two bromopropane, and so we're going to have just the ortho parameta of the isopropyl toluenes. D, we're going to do reaction at reflux, two bromo propane, and again, isopropyl toluenes with no para meta substitution. Okay? And so in lab this week, we will tell you who's doing what um, as far as what conditions you're doing. So what this means as far as your pre-lab is you need to pre-lab the entire experiment, okay? But you need this information anyway because you're going to be analyzing, you're, you're going to do your part of the reaction, but you're going to analyze four people's data, yours plus three other people, okay? So you need that information in your pre-lab anyway. So you're going to write a pre-lab for all of them. Not so pretty there. Um, Make sure in your pre-lab you incorporate both of the bromopropanes and all the possible reaction conditions and all the possible um, products that you could get out. Um, we will be evaluating these reactions with GC just like we did with experiment 8 and 11. So not, there's a lot of information in experiment 14 about GC mass spec. We won't use GC mass spec, so mass, mass spec until second semester. Um, so you will just be using GC just like you did with 8 and 11. Remember with 8 and 11 you needed the um, conditions for that we used to run the samples off the front of the GC. You're going to need those again uh, for experiment 14 because they're not the same for 8, 11, and 14. So make sure you get those recorded in your notebook. Um, you will get standard retention times just like you did for experiments 8 and 11. So we'll send you um, what those standard retention times are. You need seven standard retention times. So you need toluene, 
And then you need the six possible products, okay? So those are the standard retention times that you'll be sent to evaluate your data. Um, and then you'll need <coughs> data from the three other people. And so somehow we will get that to you. Either we make a copy of the data for you, or um, we have you coordinate with your group getting copies of that data, but somehow you will get the data of the three other people in your group, and we'll let you know this week how, how you are going to do that, okay? Um, so what you should do between now and um, when you come to lab two weeks from now is on pages 14, I believe it's 14.9 and 14.10, it tells you how to analyze that data. So once you have the data from your experiment and the three other people's experiment, use um, page 14.9 and 14.10, and there's tables on those pages that you're going to create. When um, I see you in two weeks, I'm going to go through that data analysis for one example for you. So between now and then, when you get your data, and when I see you two weeks from now, I would take a crack at going through those calculations and setting up those tables. So when you come to lab lecture, you'll know where you're having trouble and you'll know what you're not having trouble with, okay? So two weeks from now, when you are in lab, you're going to want the table that um, it describes on page 14.9 and 14.10 already put together for the data comparison. You need the tables themselves before you can discuss the data. Okay, is everybody clear on that? Okay, so once you get your data, put, put the tables together. Um, and then like I said, I will be going over that um, in lab lecture two weeks from now too. So the apparatus that you're going to use for this week is a little bit different than anything you've seen before, too. So we need to go through that. So your reaction container and your condenser are going to be all in one for the reaction this week. Okay. So you've got filtering flask is going to be used as your vessel for your reaction. You're going to have a servar in, in your filtering flask, and you're going to clamp your filtering flask on your stirrer hot plate, okay? The condensing part of your filtering flask is this portion of it, okay? So you're not going to have a condenser connected to it. So if you've got conditions under reflux, <coughs> this is where you're going to want to see condensing. You don't want to see condensing all the way through the arm into the rubber tubing, okay? Because if it condenses this way, that solvent can come back this way and bring all the black muck from that tubing back into your reaction. And then you'll get to analyze that black muck by GC because you'll see it in your chromatogram from your uh, reaction, okay? So control condensing if you are using reflex conditions. When you set this up, you want to use a dry um, piece of tubing and then set it up so that you put a little bit of an elbow here in the tubing. That's kind of like our last ditch collection area um, for collecting solvent that's gone over this direction so it doesn't go back this way, okay? So you want to put like a little bit of an elbow here in your tubing. And then you're going to put a clamp up here. You're then going to clamp right here on this funnel. So you're going to have tubing to an inverted funnel into a beaker of water. Clamp this so that your funnel is nice and horizontal in the beaker of water. And you want it so that only one millimeter of water is just abo above the lip of the funnel. So you want the funnel sitting basically on top of the water in the beaker, just barely submerged under. The reason for this part of your reaction vessel is because that is your acid trap. So remember, in the react reaction, we're going to generate um, HCl and HBr from our reaction. We need to trap it somehow. We don't want it just bubbling out of our reaction. We don't, we don't like acid just coming right off the reaction itself. So this is our acid trap into the water. When you set this up, set it up so 
things are towards the back of your hood because again we're going to generate acid you want don't want it generated right on top of you especially this part put the beaker so it's towards the back of the hood so your acid trap is back where you have the most ventilation in your hood too okay and then if you set up the reaction for reflux remember reflux gently you're going to set your setting on your um, hot plate to like one or two you barely want any heating it doesn't take much to reflux this mixture. You're not going to have a lot in here. You'll have 12 milliliters of toluene, and you'll have um, 8 milliliters, I believe, of your bromopropane. So that's, that's not a lot of stuff in there, right? Um, when you get to the point that you've got this all set up before you add anything to um, your filtering flask, so before you add the toluene or the bromopropane or the aluminum chloride, have your instructor check this, okay? Um, the aluminum chloride itself, you've got to be really careful with, okay? And, and so aluminum chloride reacts with water. Where on your body do you have fairly accessible water? Eyes, mucous membranes of your nose. And so if you, you don't want any of this in your eyes, you don't want to inhale any of the dust, because when it gets into your nose, it's going to react with the moisture in your nose and make HCL in your nose, which is really <laughs> not very pleasant. <laughs> so um, the aluminum chloride is already dispensed in small vials in the reagent hood, okay? And so you're going to weigh the vial, the cap, the aluminum chloride, so everything all together, as soon as you get it out of the reagent hood, it doesn't matter which one, they're all the same. Weigh, weigh these to start, okay? And then when you're done adding the aluminum chloride to your reaction, you're gonna weigh the vial and the cap and you'll be able to figure out how much aluminum chloride you added to your reaction, all right? Um, make sure you follow the instructions for how to add the aluminum chloride to your reaction. It doesn't go in all at once. It goes in portions, okay? So follow instructions very carefully. Again, you don't want to inhale the dust at all, so make sure you handle it in the hood. Don't have the vial open outside of the hood. When you're adding it to your reaction, have the hood sash down as low as possible so you've got a barrier between you and it. I'd wear gloves when you're handling it so it doesn't get on your hands itself um, and make those irritated. And just make sure um, to be really careful that you don't inhale any of the dust, okay? Um, when you're done, then weigh the vial and cap, figure out how much aluminum chloride you had so it should be close to a gram. If it's not exactly a gram, it's okay. Um, and then the vial itself, you can, in your hood, submerge it in a beaker of water with gloves on, kill the rest of the aluminum chloride, rinse out the vial really well, um, clean it out, dry it out, and then you can put it um, where we, we store used vials, but make sure you clean it out really well, okay? So once you submerge it in the water, you're going to kill, kill the aluminum chloride. The other thing is aluminum chloride is very corrosive, so it'll be corrosive to your spatula. So once you're done adding the aluminum chloride to your reaction, if you use the spatula to do that, make sure that you rinse the spatula off really well with water in your hood so you don't inhale the HCl gas, okay? Um, let's see, other things with the aluminum chloride. Just make sure you keep everything dry itself because it does react with water, so you don't want it reacting with something else besides your reaction. We use dry toluene because we need to keep this reaction dry. The dry toluene's in the reagent hood, so make sure that the toluene that you use to set up your reaction is the dry toluene of the reagent hood. Make sure your apparatus is completely dry. That's also why you dry the black tubing out to make sure that's completely dry. Um, before you start the reaction. So you're not killing your aluminum chloride before it has time to react, okay? <coughs> um, when you're done with your reaction, you're going to follow the workup. 
You need to be careful because part of it involves handling concentrated HCL, so make sure you handle that with care. Wear gloves. You're going to be making a dilute reaction with HCL for a dilute um, mixture with HCL to uh, quench your reaction. And then once you've added this mixture to your reaction, then it tells you you're going to separate your organic and aqueous layers in a separatory funnel. Um, what can happen is toluene and water sometimes don't separate out very well. So when you put your reaction mixture after you've quenched it with the HCl um, solution in your separatory funnel, don't put it in and then just shake the heck out of it <coughs> because you may make what's called an emulsion where the two layers don't actually separate. They kind of just make this gummy layer in the middle that looks really cloudy and doesn't show any separation. It almost looks like a third layer. So when you put your um, reaction mixture after it's been quenched into the separatory funnel, cap the separatory funnel and kind of mix the layers nicely, but don't shake the heck out of it because you may have trouble with the separation. Um, if you do have trouble with the separation, what you can use is what's called brine solution or it's sodium saturated, um, saturated sodium chloride solution. Basically, it's really salty water. And so what that does is make it so that anything organic really doesn't want to hang out in the water because not only is it water, but now it's salty, which is the opposite of most organic things. And that will help separate things out. So if you need to use um, the saturated sodium chloride solution that's in the reagent hoods, follow the um, instructions in your lab manual, okay? But do, do be careful to try and evolve, avoid the emulsion. You're also going to need to do a, a wash with water. If you had to use this to help your layers separate initially, instead of the water wash, use sodium, saturated sodium chloride for that wash as well, okay? Then you're going to dry with magnesium sulfate. We've done that a few times now. You'll filter by gravity. Um, and then you're going to um, sample, once you have your organic layer that's been dried by magnesium sulfate, that's what you're going to use for your GC sample. Okay. Before you do that, you're going to weigh your reaction mixture at the end at the end of the workup. So the end of the workup is after you dry with magnesium sulfate. And I'll explain why you're going to do this here in a second. We do this because um, we don't do anything to take the toluene, so there's going to be residual toluene because it was your solvent in the reaction too. Okay? So there's residual toluene in your reaction mixture. We don't do anything to separate the toluene and then the alkylated products that you make. Um, so we're going to use GC to figure out how much toluene is left and how much of your reaction mixture is product. We need to have the weight of the reaction mixture at the end of the workup to then use that percentage to then translate that into a mass of how much product was formed. Okay? So you're going to weigh your reaction mixture at the end of the workup. Then you're going to use your GC data to find the percentage of your mixture that was that was product. Then you'll take that percentage times this mass, and that's how much product that you generated from the reaction, and then you can calculate a percent yield. Okay? So weigh the reaction mixture, then you're going to make a GC sample. You can use one of your um, clean dry vials from experiment 8 and 11 that you should have cleaned out last week. Use a new cap though, so can use an 8 or 11 vial, meaning experiment 8 or 11, as long as it's clean, but a new GC cap, and you can take one drop and fill the rest with pentane, 
when you do that, make sure you look at the vial, make sure you don't have any, um, make sure you don't have any solids, and mm -hmm. no visible water either, because that would ruin the GC column. So after you make your GC sample, make sure you don't see any floaties, make sure you don't see any visible water in there, okay? You're going to label your GC samples similar to you, what you did for experiment eight. So use your initials, or 11, um, use your initials, use your notebook page, but then at the end, give me the letter of your experiment conditions that you use. So our A, B, C, D, tell me which conditions you used. That helps me figuring out what's going on with your reaction to make sure you get the right GC results, but also that's how I figure out what the standards are to give you for the standard retention times. Okay, so you're going to use initials, notebook page, and your reaction conditions. Okay, and then you don't need to do um, the last distillation. Okay, now what I'm going to do right now is give you a little bit of information to help you with your pre lab, since I'm making you write a pre lab for four possible experimental conditions. So, one bromopropane, its molecular weight is 123 grams per mole. Its density is 1.353 grams per milliliter. And its boiling point is 71 degrees C. Two bromopropane has the same molecular weight. They're just isomers of each other here. Density is 1.31 grams per milliliter. And then the boiling point is 59.4 degrees Celsius. So make sure you get this information. And then the other thing is make sure you get a practice exam before you leave. Go through that practice exam before you, I see you two weeks in lab lecture because I'm going to go through that practice exam and the answers to it in lab lecture. So you want to know what you don't know and what you do know.